Hey guys, Jim here. We're going to talk now about what uh, has become my absolute hands down favorite frame lock knife that I have ever owned. We're looking right now at the Rockstead Shun, S H U N. It is pronounced Shun. Uh, it is a 4 and 1 8 inch ZDP 189 VG10 clad steel and what I like to call a reverse tanto. And that's really the best name that I can apply to this particular blade shape. They may classify it as something different, but that's that's the best I got for you. Uh, it's 8 inches overall in length, and that makes this the largest folding knife that Rockstead has ever made. Uh, and you, you'll see right here, considerably larger than my Rockstead shin. And here they are butt to butt as all things should be and you see it is considerably larger this is a three and a half inch blade on the shin but for right now we're going to get that one out of the way and focus primarily here now one of the neat features about this this uh, frame lock is going to be built in with an integral over travel stop and steel lock bar insert. We'll take a look at that locking interface right there. So you can see it very clearly from here, but from this side, you don't even know that it's there. Now, uh, you might have just noticed the numbering here. The only thing that's different about this knife versus what you can go out and purchase right now, this is number 13 of a 20 piece special edition run. Basically, the ones that you'll buy right now, if you go to Knife Center or Heine Haynes uh, or any other retailer that carries them, the frame will be done in black DLC. Not the blade, but just the frame. And the difference here is this one looks like the prototype version, which was done just in the natural coloration of titanium. Now, speaking of the prototype, who designed this knife? This was designed by Dmitry Sinkovich, who is a massively talented custom knife maker from Belarus, uh, which is just outside of Russia. Dmitry blends the world of art and utility in all of his designs, and he kind of tends to lean toward very geometric influence designs. And you can see some of that flavor coming out in the milling that's done here in the frame. Uh, his knives are usually slender, long, and futuristic looking. Again, this is the perfect example of that. Oh, God, this thing is so absolutely gorgeous. Now, I have not had a chance to own one of Dimitri's knives yet. Unfortunately, they're extremely hard to get. Uh, you don't really get on his books. He doesn't really take any orders, so it's just, you know, it's kind of like whatever you happen to come across, maybe a collector is selling, or if you know somebody in Russia, Russian dealers tend to get a hold of his knives, you're going to pay out the S, that's just the way it is, but uh, they're absolutely worth it. He is a, a, a creative genius, that's for sure. Now, let's talk more about uh, the knife itself and about Rockstead. Now, I've made several Rockstead videos in the past. I've made the unboxing video for my shin. I did a two-part review of the shin, and I put as much detail as I possibly could into those videos, but we're going to go over some of those again. And I also made a, a video on the Rockstead uh, tie, or tay, however you'd like to pronounce that. I consider Rockstead to be the Bentley of knives. They're made with the greatest care, the highest possible degree of finishing, and they typically are rarer than most other production knives. You don't really see a lot of them uh, up for sale anywhere either. Um, when you see one in person, it looks expensive, it feels expensive, but the real value is going to be in the performance of their blades. Now if you check out YouTube you're going to see some old videos that Rockstead themselves had actually posted and um, they put all of, not all of, but the, the knives in the videos, they put those edges to the test. Now the reason they needed to do that was when people saw the extraordinarily high Rockwell hardness of their steel, which this one also is <laughs> extraordinarily high, uh, people assume that the edges were going to be brittle, prone to chipping, rolling, uh, because when your standard high quality knife that uses the same type of steel, uh, they usually ring in around 59 or so on the, uh, the Rockwell hardness. 
Rockstead will typically between be between 63 and 70, which is astronomical. This particular blade is a 67 Rockwell, and you'll see, you should see a little dimple right up here when the camera focuses. See if I can find it. Uh, I can't find the dimple. Usually you'll see a little dimple exposed on the blade. See if I could take it out of frame here and look myself. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, but there's usually a little dimple uh, somewhere on the blade where they do the Rockwell hardness. This was a 67, which is almost unbelievable. And that means you're going to have a, a super razor sharp edge that's going to hold an edge for a really, really, really long time. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. Now remember, as the hardness increases, generally toughness will decrease, and that's the balance that has to be played between the two. But one thing we shouldn't forget here is that the Japanese have perfected the art of crafting steel into legendary hardness and toughness thousands of years ago. And that knowledge is being used today by Rockstead. So when you look at their videos, you'll see them make a thousand push cuts through 25 millimeter thick hemp rope. And then they'll take that same knife and they'll slice through the thinnest paper like it's still a razor sharp edge. Um, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, in other videos, they repeatedly uh, hack at dry bamboo, and then they do the same paper slicing to prove that the edge has not been degraded, it's not chipped or otherwise destroyed. Now, it's not to say that it's completely impervious, it's just a lot stronger than a typical knife would be. And some people call it hype, and that's fine. Uh, so what Rockstead began to do was they started doing those tests live and in person in front of people at the various knife shows that they would visit. You go to the Blade Show, you go to the New York Custom Knife Show, and you'll see them doing that in person right in front of you. And it's crazy. But I can tell you just from my experience with my shin, uh, I would strop this maybe every three or four months after I owned it for a year and a half, the edge was just a little bit off of what it was factory new. So I uh, handed it to a gentleman from Rockstead. It wasn't Mr. Hanada. He had already left the company. I don't, I don't remember who it was. Uh, but I handed it to him at the Blade Show 2014. He took it back to Japan, did a resharpen on it. I had it back two weeks later, and it was just as sharp as it was brand spanking new. Now, between that time, Blade Show, June 2014, I would have gotten it back, say, uh, let's call it August of 2014. It's now November 2015. I've stropped this once, and it's still as sharp as the day I got it back. And this has actually seen quite a bit of use, and you'll see I've shown this before, but there's, uh, you know, there's a few little marks on my blade and stuff like that. There you can see them right there. So it's, it's not that the knife hasn't been used. It most certainly has. I just take really good care of my shit. But the, the longevity of that edge is, is truly insane. Now, when you look at the shin, mine is the DLC-coated YXR7 steel. The other steel they use here is the clad blade, the ZDP-189. Every ZDP model is treated with a titanium aluminum coating, and that helps to resist showing some wear marks on these fully mirror polished bevels. What they've done here is a really nice matte finish and then you get a higher satin on this hollow ground top swedge and then on the actual primary bevel itself it is an absolute perfect flawless mirror. You can actually see me and my camera right here. You can probably even read my shirt. Yeah, here we go. Hey, hello. It is a perfect, flawless mirror. And if you look really closely, right around there, you'll actually see where the uh, cladding takes place with the ZDP-189 and the VG-10. It's, it's just it's extraordinary. It really is. I love the entire design of the knife. I love how it feels in the hand. Uh, I love the little pop of color with the blue standoffs. This thing is just masterfully, masterfully created. Now, when you get back to Rockstead in general, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the creation 
and the finishing of the blades that you're really paying for. Listen, there are a lot of people that could never justify the cost of a Rockstead. When I bought my Shin, these were eleven fifty. The next year, they went up to thirteen fifty. They've actually gone down. I don't understand their pricing structure, uh, how they actually go up and then down. Right now, I think you can buy these for ten fifty in the uh, YXR seven black DLC blade. The Shin, I'm sorry, the Shun. Uh, when you buy it right now, it's uh, twenty one fifty at pretty much every place I've seen them for sale. And a lot of people go, well, that's a shitload of money to spend on a production knife. I want you to keep something in mind. Each knife as a whole is made in a factory aided by machines. So that's really where you get that production status from. It is a production knife. But the blade goes through a very laborious handmade process. And they also, at the, at the end there, use a proprietary machine to give you a mirror-finished edge. Now, I'm not talking about the bevel. I'm talking about the actual edge itself. You'll notice there is no delineation between the mirror polishing in the bevel and the mirror polishing on the edge. It is a true, smooth mirror on that edge. And that could be accomplished on any steel sitting down if you're proficient enough with a wicked edge you'll get that nice completely smooth mirror edge on there and it's very very highly desirable for certain cutting tasks it's not going to be great for just slicing through the skin of a tomato uh, but pretty much everything else I mean it just because with that you need a little bit of toothiness with everything else it just glides right through grab a sheet of paper here and give you guys an idea of what we're talking about it is completely effortless and what I'm doing here I'm just push cutting I'm not slicing like I would be doing it here and just to show you my shin still maintaining the same degree of sharpness I used to have a little snag in it right around here and then when they touched up the blade it came back perfect so it's not really it's not about out of the box sharpness every knife you buy should be sharp out of the box to be perfectly honest with you obviously we know that not all of them are but it's about the longevity of that edge about how long you're going to keep that edge by the way I'm only cleaning this off here so that when you're looking at this in HD you don't see a bunch of crap all over my blade I don't carry a microfiber cloth with me <laughs> when I'm using my knives uh, just being overly anal for the sake of HD video so let's get back to Rockstead in general uh, and back to that edge when you look at a standard knife edge and you view it under a microscope and it's intensely magnified you'll see these little teeth these little serrations in the edge of the blade and I don't care who's sharpening it that's the way you're going to receive the knife and almost every knife is going to be like that but if you look at a Rockstead edge under a microscope you see only a very clean smooth edge and that's what allows their blades to so cleanly glide through whatever you're cutting um, I'll be honest with you with the edge and the bevels mirrored the way that they are when you cut with a Rockstead it feels like absolutely nothing else now they also claim that the reason that they do that mirror edge is uh, it's increasing the spectrum of Rockstead's performance uh, basically uh, they're saying that it reduces chipping because it has that that perfectly smooth edge there's no areas in between little teeny tiny microscopic serrations where it can begin to chip more easily can you chip a, a Rockstead blade absolutely of course you can uh, but it's much more difficult than with any other knife that you're going to experience particularly at a 67 Rockwell hardness now the other thing that plays into the value is the fact that Rockstead only produces about 65 to 70 knives per month that's it to put that in perspective you look at a standard production company they could produce 500 knives in a single day Rockstead instead focuses on precision and perfection with every knife they produce and they employ six master knife makers in the factory that's it just six of them 
So they couldn't produce more even if they want to. And only, and, and what I'm hearing, and I don't, I can't validate this, but from what I understand, only about a hundred of each individual model is even imported into the U.S. every year. So in the U.S., we're likely to only see a hundred of the shoon. In the U.S., we only saw a hundred of the shin, so on and so forth. So it's extremely limited, and anything that's limited is going to carry with it some sort of uh, additional value to it. So, yeah, you are paying a lot of money, but you really are getting a lot out of it. There is far more, and I mean far more handwork involved with a Rockstead than any other production knife in existence. And that's why Rockstead themselves use the term production custom for all of their knives. Now, each knife begins their life on a 5-axis CNC, including the initial profile for the blade. Each of these precise specifications are met by the CNC, which is what they say far greater precision than could be done with the human hand. The steel goes off to heat treat and cryogenic treatment by what is actually the most famous company for this work in all of Japan. The company's called Hata Kogio or Kogio. I, I apologize, I don't speak Japanese, but it's H-A-T-T-A. -T -T the other word is K-O-G-Y-O. And they even have their own dedicated heat treat oven and quenching station in that place. Uh, Rockset has a very specific method for the quenching that requires having their own separate areas so that they're not treated like every other uh, steel that comes in there from other places. So that's kind of neat. Uh, so uh, Hata Kyogo actually leases them that additional space. After it's finished, uh, they do the, the Rockwell hardness and begin the polishing process. Now, I discussed this before in my other videos. What they do is they sit down with wet sandpaper, and they do all of this by hand. They start at a 400 grit. They refine the blade through 600 grit, 800 grit, 1200, and they finally they end up at 2000 grit to get to the blade that you see right here. If at any time during any of those processes the blade scratches, there's even a small little scratch that appears, they have to go back to the previous step and start all over again. So it really is a rather laborious process. At the very end, they run it through a proprietary machine that finishes the edge in the same way the bevels are done in that perfect mirror. And after that, all the blades go off for coatings for either DLC or as I mentioned before with the ZDP blades, getting that titanium aluminum coating. Now a note on the ZDP 189, uh, there are lovers and there are critics of the steel. What not everyone knows is what Hitachi actually developed the steel for. There are two camps here, uh, you know, one that admires the steel for its high hardness and its cutting properties, and the others that say the steel is far too fragile and the cutting edge is unstable because it's prone to chipping. And I get that. The difference of opinion is the result of consumers not really having all of the necessary information. ZDP 189 isn't to be used on blades with a hollow grind, period. Hitachi tells you this uh, in their spec sheets. Uh, it wasn't originally conceived for that purpose at all. Also, uh, when heat treating it, it has to be cryo-treated within 20 minutes after completion of the heat treating process. Uh, they get all kinds of technical on that, but basically it's, it's necessary to convert the retained austenite into martensite so that the martensite increases the hardness and thermal conductivity. It unifies the structure of the steel and increases the wear resistance. That's why when... A lot of times when people talk about a great degree of wear resistance in a blade, a lot of times they'll actually be referring to ZDP 189 when they're talking about that uh, because it really, really is good for that. It's a great performing steel, but not everybody can work with it. Now, I am dabbling a little bit with very, very basic editing, so my camera likes to cut me off around 20 minutes. What I'm hoping is that my basic editing skills have improved enough that I can put these two parts together. Uh, if for some reason this cuts off right now, go look for version or part number two. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to continue right where I'm leaving off right here. Give me one second.
Hopefully you're seeing this without any interruption in the, in the uh, transition here. Otherwise, you're watching part two. Now, we've talked about Rockstead as a company. We've talked about why they're worth the money that they charge. Listen, if you go out and buy a production knife for 30 bucks, 50 bucks, 200 bucks, $400, you don't get the level of hand craftsmanship that you're getting here. You don't get the same sharpness. You don't get the same longevity on that sharpness. There's a lot that goes into play when you're buying a knife at this level. Yeah, I could go out and buy a really amazing custom knife for the same money. I'm blessed. I have a lot of really great custom knives from some really, really great makers. But I can tell you right now, I've had this for about two and a half years. I would never let this knife go. This, to this day, no matter what else has come in and out of my collection, and you guys have seen most of those here on my channel, this is still one of my favorite knives ever, period. And I love the fact that this knife is so smooth in its action without using bearings. I mean, this thing is set up on phosphor bronze washers, and it is wonderfully smooth. It's almost a hydraulic feeling. It's not like... I'm releasing the lock and it's dropping instantly all the way down. It's got a wonderful kind of hydraulic feel to it. Now, I don't let it drop as freely as my other knives because I'll be honest with you, this knife has bitten me once. I don't ever want it to bite me again. It is scary sharp. There are only a handful of knives I've ever owned in my life that I was a little bit afraid of, and my Rocksteads certainly are that. And when you get to the Shun with its much larger blade, uh, it, it's actually much heavier. Now this one hasn't broken in yet, so it's not going to drop as freely. Even when um, I set my, sh my shin out and had it sharpened, when I got it back, it was as tight as it was, <clears throat> excuse me, when it was brand new. And it took another month for it to break in and start dropping in that hydraulic fashion. So I'm going to assume uh, that this one's going to do the same thing. I mean, they really have built a flawless knife here. It is wonderfully executed. All the finishes are great. They don't typically work with titanium. Uh, they released a model last year. I think it was their first item uh, actually in titanium and did a beautiful job on it. I love the concave pivot design that uh, Dimitri has created for this knife. It's just a Just a cool look. It's still functional. You can still make the adjustments from this side, but that side is also concaved in the same manner. Thumb studs are easy to access. Jimping is almost useless, I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's not a knife without its flaws. It, I mean, this isn't a tactical knife anyway, but this is a knife designed for cutting shit. So when I cut shit, I, I want to have that additional purchase there. And it's completely and utterly useless. The other downside, and this is the same way for every Rockstead, no matter how much beauty and work they're putting into their knives, they fall short with a really cheap pocket clip. Bent steel pocket clip here. Now this one's titanium, but it's still just a spring clip. Now I'll give it credit where credit is due. It works great. It is super easy to get in and out of the pocket, yet still has the perfect amount of retention where it doesn't feel insecure in the pocket in any way. I'm not a big fan of deep carry pocket clips where it drops all the way inside the pocket so I wanted to put a lanyard on mine as you guys have seen my my custom logo lanyard by Chris Black Designs. Uh, I'm glad they put the uh, notches in here with the holes here so it, it allowed me to put that on there without using the standoff because that blade would have shredded this the first time I closed it. Now what they've done and I've seen other companies do this, Olamic Cutlery was the first company I saw do it these are actually shaped in a way that it will kind of grab your finger. So when you're pulling it out of your pocket with your finger or thumb, it'll kind of grab it a little bit. It does make it a little bit easier to pop out, but still, deep carry pocket clips, I just don't care for them. But yeah, I mean, on a $2,150 full titanium frame lock, that should honestly be a 3D sculpted titanium clip that looks as nice as the knife that it's going on. You know, there's a little bit of similarity here. If you, you know, kind of look off to the side and squint your eye, it could kind of maybe remind you of a Shirogorov. And what does Shirogorov do? They give you really nice sculpted titanium clips that match 
the quality level of the knife. So yeah, you're buying a $2,100 knife and you're getting a dime store friggin' pocket clip. That really is the only thing about this entire knife that I would change. That's it. I mean, and if that's the only thing, you're doing pretty damn good. Let's get some nice close-up views on this. And we'll see the sculpting of the titanium. You notice that the hardware that's being used to hold the knife together uh, is also going to be in that same concaved shape that the pivot is. They've left a natural matte finish, bead blasted finish on the lower portions of the frame. And I apologize, I've got fingerprints all over this. But on all the high portions where my finger is following here, that's done in a nice satin. So you get a really cool two-tone effect and you feel the geometric uh, effects of this design. They're, they're very, very well pronounced. Taking a look back here, we see the first of the two standoffs done in a nice, rich, royal blue. They've got these additional pins, and I don't know if they're really there for decoration, or they're, or they're there for extra stability and strength. It really wouldn't need it, because between your pivot, this standoff, and this standoff in titanium, it's not going to flex, it's not going to bend, but... Uh, these are press fit in there. I'm assuming it's there for structure, uh, but it could be there for design. It looks pretty damn cool, I think. Normally, I'm not a fan of just putting extra shit into a knife, but I, I think it works well here. Looks good. And then, that's the most important part right there. Let's wipe any uh, dust or residue off of there so we get a nice clean look at the blade. You'll see that very fine eggshell finish and matte finish that's been applied to the flats. And I think that that helps to make the mirror portions stand out even more. They're even more pronounced. And again, there's that very aggressive top swedge. That top swedge is done in a really cool hollow grind. I need to get the camera to focus there for a second though. It's trying to focus on the things that are being reflected in the blade. So you're probably not going to get a good look at that and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, I just, I can't get it to focus better. I apologize. <clears throat> Come on. That's a little bit better. And we look at it from this side. You'll always have the model name, the model name written in Japanese, the individual numbering. Again, this is number 13 out of the 20 they made in this finish. Uh, otherwise, in the all-black DLC frame, it's still going to have a number there. It'll say LO and then the number. And then there, there as you see, it says Sinkovich Design. This knife has been great. I've only had it for about a week and a half, and I've carried it for probably seven or eight days out of that week and a half, and I've just been loving the shit out of it. Listen to it as it locks up. Very solid. Very, very smooth. Actually, it's already breaking in nicely. I can feel the difference from the last time I carried it to today. This might be a big game changer for me. Having this knife in my collection now, I really don't feel a need to buy any other knives right now. Certainly no other frame locks. It's a fantastic size. It's a nice big knife. It's insanely sharp. It feels good to carry. It feels amazing to cut with. It's slim, lightweight for its size. There's nothing more I could ever want. And besides just satisfying a, a desire of, ooh, that maker made a really cool knife, I want to buy that. Aside from that, I really don't see a need to buy anything else. And that's not like me. I'm, I'm, a, very <laughs> I'm a very impulsive buyer. I just buy shit to buy shit sometimes. 
I am, <coughs> excuse me, obviously very picky and very choosy about uh, the quality of the product that I buy, but a lot of times I just buy, 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 buy. Having this in my collection right now, it's almost an end-all, be-all for me. As a matter of fact, I'm not actively looking at dealer websites or looking on the knife sale hashtag on Instagram. I don't give a shit what's out there. I don't want to buy anything. I have a few orders with a few makers in the, in the upcoming years that I'll, you know, I'll obviously satisfy those, uh, those commitments. But I really don't feel any desire to own another knife. I have all the different kinds of knives that I love that satisfy me currently in my collection that once I've gotten this, I don't feel the need for anything else. I'm not saying that if you just buy this knife and it's your one and only knife that you'll never want another knife. I have all the Tantos that I want. I have the Flippers that I want. I have Damascus and Sanmai and Timascus and Mokutai and all those things that I want. Those needs are satisfied. So that now when I look at this and I carry this and I cut with it, I go, do I really... Do I really need anything else? Do I really want anything else? And the answer right now is no. Now, admittedly, I am still in the honeymoon stage. I've only had it for, like I said, about a week and a half. But I just don't, I don't feel the need to buy anything else. This is just about the single perfect knife. If I were to make my perfect Rockstead, it would be this size. It would have a sculpted titanium clip. And it would be a flipper. If this knife were a flipper, holy shit, I'd probably sell half the knives that I have. I probably wouldn't want to carry anything else. It's that damn good. And I can have the confidence in knowing that when I do use it on whatever routine basis that I use my knives in, I'm going to be sharpening this a lot less frequently than any other knife I have. So to have that promise of less upkeep, that's a big deal for me. I'm lazy by nature. I don't want to go out and either I don't want to learn how to sharpen my own knives. Let me tell you right now, I don't want to take a $500,000, $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 knife and try to put an edge on it myself. If I screw it up, I'm screwed. So I send my knives back to the original makers and have them sharpen it. I don't want to do that. The cool thing is when it does come time for that, you know, I've done my routine stropping here and there, and when it actually needs a new edge, they have the sharpening program. Basically all you're paying for is the shipping, expedited shipping in and out of Japan. So for like 60 bucks, I send it in, they put a brand new edge on it, refinish it, and I get it back. Here's the trick, and it is a pain in the ass. You can't just buy a Rockstead and sharpen it yourself. You can't just buy a Rockstead and send it to your buddy who does knife sharpening uh, as a hobby or even as a trade. You're never going to get the exact same finish out of the overall blade. It's not going to happen. The knife will never look like it did and may not ever perform like it did unless it goes back to Rockstead. So there is that caveat. It could be a pain in the ass. But really all good things are like that. You wouldn't take, if you had a Ferrari, you wouldn't take it down to the local gas station and garage to have any work done, even something as minor as an oil change. You're going to pay extra, you're going to drive out of your way, and you're going to take the time out to go to a Ferrari dealership and have it serviced. If you have a very high-end mechanical wristwatch, you're not going to take that down to the local battery station kiosk in the mall to have even the most routine work replacing the gaskets in your case back. You're not going to do that. You're going to send it to an authorized repair center or back to that brand, period. So yeah, you're, you're going to have little inconveniences when you buy the finer things in life. It's not something that should be looked upon as a bad thing. Just something that you should be aware of as you're entering that purchase. You're committing to over $2,000, and I don't want you to have any unrealistic expectations. 
Is it a completely impervious blade made of some super steel that can never chip and never wear? No. It is much more likely to retain an edge longer than anything else you'll ever own. Um, <clears throat> there are some great videos on YouTube and I, I implore you to watch them. Nebulax did a great series, several videos, where he took his, and I don't remember which model he had, but he took his Rockstead and he did his own cut tests. He took the same blade steel in two or three other knives, which was ZDP 189, did the exact same tests. And one was a Spyderco, a great friggin' knife. And he did all the, the cardboard cutting and everything else. He cut cardboard a thousand times, and after every 100 cuts, he went back and he cut paper, very thin paper, and he logged everything. The other knives could not perform to the level that Rockstead did. It simply held its edge better for a much longer period of time. Period. And when you realize that that's what you're buying into, you're not just buying a pretty knife, it certainly is pretty, but you're buying into performance on a higher level than other knives can be expected to perform at, it's worth the money for the people that want that. If all you've ever bought were, you know, $50, $60, $80 Kershaws, and you don't understand why somebody would spend $2,000 on a knife, I hope this helped to explain that to you, but I'm not here to change your mind. If you've only ever driven a Honda, you may never understand why somebody would pay $250,000 for a Bentley. That's totally fine. That's why they make so many different cars. That's why they make so many different knives. For me, this is about as perfect as I could ever expect a knife to be. And if, if it performs anywhere near as well or as long as my shin has, I think I made a damn good investment. All right, guys, I'm out of here for now. Thank you so much for watching, as always, and I'll catch you on the next video.